Good morning and welcome to today's webinar, a collaboration between the Recruitment Training and Support Center, or RTSC, of the Federation for Children with Special Needs and the Neuropsychology and Education Services for Children and Adolescents, otherwise known as NESCA. I am Mary Beth Landy, the Training, Recruitment and Support Specialist of Western Mass, and I am moderating today's webinar, Testing in the Re Age of Remote Learning, presented by Dr. Ann Helmus. Dr. Helmus is an internationally renowned clinical neuropsychologist and the founder and director of NESCA, a client and family-centered group of seasoned neuropsychologists and allied staff, several of whom have presented webinars for us in the past. If I were to name all of Dr. Helmus's achievements and accolades, we wouldn't have time for the presentation. So I will direct you to the link in the chat for more details about her career. During today's webinar, please type your questions into the question and answer toolkit at the bottom of your screen, and we will try to answer them at the end of the presentation. Past webinars, including those of NESCA clinicians and staff, are archived on our RTSC webinar, along with many resources impacting the students in child welfare system. It is now my honor to welcome Dr. Ann Helmus. Thank you so much, Mary Beth. Um, it's great to be here with all of you, and, um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing the questions and comments so that we can all sort of work through this question together of how are we going to test kids um, in the new reality that's presenting itself. Um, I was saying to Mary Beth, one of the, the nice things about this particular time in history is that it's our first pandemic, all of us, and, um, and so we're all working together to try to figure things out for the kids here in the Commonwealth. And um, I'm gonna present sort of my thinking on the testing based on a lot of research um, in terms of trying to figure out how NESCO is gonna move forward with these new challenges. Um, but I am by no means an expert on how you test in the time of a pandemic, so I'm, I'm gonna be very interested for people's um, questions and criticisms and comments and, and all the rest uh, that hopefully we can make the experience better um, for all the kids. Um, so I was just reflecting that it's been eight weeks since the Massachusetts schools closed and that we've been scrambling around trying to figure out um, how we're going to meet the needs of children relying on Zoom. Um, and <clears throat> so this all came pretty fast at NESCA. Um, on March 15th, when it became clear that the schools were going to be closing and everything was changing, I said to my staff, please try to get all of your clients in um, as quickly as you can who need testing this week. Finish up all of your testing because March 19th, we're closing the doors and I don't know how long they're gonna be closed and I don't know what will happen next, but let's at least try to close up as many cases as we possibly can, um, knowing that it would not be easy to do the testing via Zoom, but that we could do feedbacks via Zoom, that they could certainly write reports at home and that kind of thing. So the, those few final days in the middle of March were really crazy here as we tried to pull all kinds of kids in to finish up their testing. And then we shut the doors and turned off the lights and we are just turning them back on. Today actually is our first day that we're welcoming a client family into Newton. Um, so one of the things that I wanna or one of the contexts that I wanna give for thinking about testing is that um, we view testing as being just one of the components of an evaluation um, of a child. And so, you know, we don't draw conclusions based strictly on testing. We also have to embed testing within the child's history and with observations. And so just a, a really concrete example of that would be, if I give a reading test to a child and the child does poorly on the reading test, I wanna look back at the history and see, did this child have any difficulty learning how to read? Were there any problems with language development that would explain why this child is doing poorly on a reading testing? Um, and then the other thing I would wanna look at is observations. Have the parents observed that this child has trouble reading? Are the teachers concerned about this child's reading? And so testing in and of itself doesn't, you know, sort of carry the day. So in that example, if I found that a child did poorly on reading tests, and their history didn't look like they had a reading disability. The teacher wasn't concerned about the child's reading. Parents weren't concerned about the child's reading. 
I would assume that the reason that the child did poorly on the reading test was some reason other than that they have a reading disability. Um, perhaps they were anxious, perhaps they weren't paying attention, who knows, but um, when we're trying to evaluate a child, we always want to look at history, observations, and testing. And in, in different children, depending on the referral question and, and on who the child is, different ones of those components will be more or less important. And I think one of the things that we're all going to have to do in the current era where actual testing is going to be much more challenging is to take careful histories, to get observations of parents, of teachers, of tutors, um, and really get good at integrating all of this information when we're drawing conclusions about kids because I think we're going to be less able to rely on testing scores. Um, so um, when the public health concerns became apparent um, and we realized that we were going to have to come up with some kind of a plan that was going to balance safety, keeping all of my staff safe, keeping all of your children safe um, so that nobody was going to be exposed, but also an effective um, mode of, of assessing kids. Um, I brainstormed and did a lot of research and found out what other practices were doing and um, went to all the webinars that were available to me to figure out what would be the best option for NESCA. And um, so I've listed here, you know, what some of the things were that, that I brainstormed and then I'll go through each of those things step by step in terms of what I see the role of them being. Um, the first thing that I thought is, well, we'll just suspend all testing. And in the very beginning of this pandemic, um, it looked to me like we were all going to be out of school and out of work for six weeks and then we would return and life would go back to normal and everything would be fine and we would just have this sort of short um, gap and certainly the world can live without testing for six weeks and so at first I thought well that's what's going to happen we're just going to come back to work later. Um, as the situation unfolded and it became clear that we weren't all going back to work in school in six weeks um, I started looking at other kinds of options. The one that was you know, being talked about most on the listservs that I was on was teletherapy. Um, and so I attended a couple of webinars about that and I'll go into that in a minute. Um, another practice was using a plexiglass shield, which I'll show you. Social distancing is something that we talked about. And then we finally um, came up with what I'm calling for lack of a better label, NESCA's sort of two office model. And I'm gonna sort of show you each one of these and, and talk about them. Um, I will say that I feel like I've had the advantage of having a great group of professionals that I work with here. And one of the things that I did right in the beginning was to divide my group into smaller groups of four or five uh, clinicians. And then I met with each of those groups weekly, continue to, um, so that we could talk through all of these things. And so it has been great to get input from sort of the whole group, but divided into small groups. So this uh, sort of reflects the thinking of not just me, but um, of the people that I'm lucky enough to work with on a daily basis. Um, so the first, um, you know, the first thing that we did in the beginning was we just suspended all testing. Um, and, you know, clearly this is not a realistic long-term solution. Um, if anything, there's going to be an increased need for evaluations um, for kids who have been going through this pandemic situation because as we're all aware, this is, you know, taking its toll on the mental health of kids and parents, of everybody, all of us, um, and that clearly it's going to impact kids' social emotional development and kids' academic progress. And so if anything, the pandemic is going to create new cases um, of situations where kids are struggling and the question is why are they struggling and what do they need. Um, when school reopens, which I hope and pray will be in September, um, I think schools are going to be inundated with evaluations that have to be carried out. Um, I know that many evaluations got uh, cut short during the spring mm -hmm. and it's unclear whether those could be picked back up again six months later. Um, and then of course there's going to be the whole um, backlog of cases of kids that needed to have their three-year evaluations this spring, kids who are going to need their three-year evaluations in the fall, um, and that's going to obviously be a tremendous problem. Um, and, you know, NESCA is really committed to figuring out how we can partner with schools and parents 
so that we can help plan for children with special needs. And a lot of times to be able to do that planning, we need to have good information from a, an evaluation. So suspending all testing is not a long-term solution. Um, so teletherapy, um, when all of this happened, I was very jealous of all of my colleagues who just do psychotherapy because they took their entire caseload and they just put them on Zoom and life sort of went on the way that it had prior to that. Um, it's not so easy to do testing um, via Zoom. Um, and I won't go into a detailed discussion of this, but just to give you a flavor, and I'm happy to answer questions about this. Um, the first problem with testing by Zoom are the technical issues. And I'm sure we've all been in enough Zoom meetings that freeze and you lose sound and all of that. Um, and that's really a problem when you're trying to do testing. And in fact, the guidance that I was reading said, if you had a technical glitch in the middle of a test, you would have to invalidate the test. Um, and so that could be problematic, you know, if you were in the middle of an IQ test or something like that. Um, then the APA and other groups like that, the American Psych Association, um, raised the many ethical issues with doing um, testing by Zoom. And some of those issues include the fact that there's been no research done that shows whether testing through Zoom is actually valid or not. Um, and in fact, I was really surprised to learn that with regard to children, that there's only been two scientific studies that tried to look at the reliability and validity of testing um, online in this way. And they weren't particularly well-designed papers and the results were kind of equivocal. Um, so it's not sort of an overwhelming resounding response that, that you know, it's valid to do something over the computer that you used to do in person. Um, there are also a lot of uh, ethical issues around releasing tests. So um, tests are supposed to be kept under lock and key because otherwise if they were just released into the general public, then they wouldn't be valid anymore because people would understand what the questions were and what the tasks are. And so even like if we're involved in legal situations, we would never release testing protocols to lawyers. We would only release them to other psychologists working with the lawyers because psychologists have an ethical obligation to keep tests content um, a secret. Um, and so if we were sending these out or putting them on a screen where somebody could take a screenshot, that would be a problem. Um, and then there are a bunch of legal issues like copyright laws, you know, to be able to send out copyrighted material to people that they would need, you know, for test forms and that kind of thing. Um, we were concerned that even if we took on all of these problems that I've mentioned and we decided to forge ahead and do an evaluation via teletherapy, that it would be very easy and, and for a school to say or for an attorney to say, and they would be correct, you know, we don't know if we believe these results. And so now we've gone to more trouble than we normally would to do the testing and the results aren't, aren't helping us at our, all, aren't helping the child, aren't helping the school. Um, what was the point of having done that? So we were really concerned about the credibility issue. So we put teletherapy on the back burner. Um, <clears throat> But then I, you know, went on to talk to some other clinicians about what they were doing, and um, in some ways, a little surprised when I talked to a clinician at Children's Hospital, and I said, "What are you, what are you doing for testing?" And he said, "All teletherapy." He works in an um, autism program over at Children's Hospital, and I told him what what our concerns were, and he said, "Yeah, we share all of the same concerns. However," Um, what our clinic does is to diagnose a lot of kids with autism to make them eligible to get insurance coverage of ABA, to get school-based services, you know, things like that. And, you know, we feel that there's an ethical problem denying this type of testing um, to kids who really need the diagnosis so that they can move forward and get services. And so as he and I sort of talked through it, um, what we determined is that you know, there are situations where it is, it's ethical to do this um, because, you know, there's a need, for example, to diagnose a child with autism, and that the test results, the actual test scores are not the key determinant. Um, and so when you're making a diagnosis of autism, for example, obviously the child's history is of critical um, importance and also observational data. So in fact, um, an instrument like the CARS, which is a very detailed parent interview, um, is based on parent observation. Something like that can be done um, via teletherapy. 
And whatever testing you get out of the child or you don't get out of the child, it's probably not going to change the diagnosis of, of autism spectrum disorder, for example. Um, so I think that's one instance in which it may make sense to, to do teletherapy. And I, I understand children's hospitals um, policy on this and why they're doing it this way. And I think that makes perfect sense. Um, we also had a couple of clients here at NESCA who um, were, had significant mental health issues and really needed to have some kind of testing in order to document their mental health issues so that they could be put in a therapeutic program or be hospitalized. And, um, and again, you know, it may not be 100% valid, but when you weigh it against a child with significant mental health issues not getting what they need in that moment, um, I felt like this was the right decision. Um, so what I said to my staff is, if you have a situation where you feel the teletherapy is the right thing to do, let's discuss it. I don't think there's a blanket rule here that it's good or it's bad. I think it's, um, it's a cost benefit analysis and um, that we just need to be thoughtful about what we're doing it, how we're doing it, how we report it so that we can raise the caveats right from the beginning, you know, that this may not be as valid as face to face, but here's what we do think is valid. Um, and, you know, one of the things that was brought up in one of the webinars that I went to that really um, made me take pause is, you know, bad data is worse than no data. Um, because I think at first I was sort of thinking like, well, you know, if it's not 100% valid, we'll still get, you know, we'll, we'll still get something out of it and we, we should be able to say something from doing it and then really pausing to say, yeah, but if what you get out of it is not accurate and it's bad data, then you're really worse off than if you had no data, you'd be better off waiting. And so these are the kinds of questions that we're trying to grapple with um, in situations of teletherapy is, is it better, you know, how, how useful do we think the data is going to be? What's the question? What's the problem with waiting? Um, all of that. Um, so there, we do have a role for teletherapy um, in NESCA evaluations. So like many neuropsychologists, our evaluation consists of a parent intake, two testing sessions, and then a parent feedback. And we've decided in terms of trying to minimize the risk um, to families and to clinicians that we'll do the parent intake and the parent feedback um, through teletherapy. And so far that seems to be going well um, with the families that we've worked with. And, um, and I think it's a nice balancing of sort of safety and effectiveness. The other um, thing that we're doing is maybe some brief testing. Again, my thought is <clears throat> that the more that we can keep people from coming into the office, the shorter the time is that they spend in the office, the better. Um, and so I've said to clinicians, <clears throat> look at the referral question, look at the testing battery, and there may be some things that, um, that are concrete, that are easy to do, that you can do via teletherapy, and, um, and go ahead and do that, but obviously clearly mark that these three tests were done via teletherapy. And a lot of these might be more like sort of questionnaire data that you're doing with kids about their executive functioning or things like that. Um, okay. Um, so, we um, decided that we were going to uh, do office-based assessments, and I'm going to explain uh, how we're doing those in just a minute. But um, this is all, you know, pretty standard, and I think this is going to be happening in most businesses now. Is that, that there's going to be all kinds of safety precautions put in place so that you can um, minimize the the risk of exposure. So we have a, a questionnaire that clinicians and clients complete um, every day about exposure risk. When they come in, there's a temperature check uh, for the child, for the parent, and the clinician, hand sanitizing. Um, by touchless check-in process, um, everything is laid out so that the parents come in, fill out the informed consent, which um, we now have to have informed consent around the pandemic, that they're giving consent to testing in an office where there's the potential risk that they could become infected. Um, and we have arrows on the floor, so they just follow the arrows back to where the testing room is. And I have my admin is in an office that has a window so she can observe all of this. There's a phone number there, so if the thermometer's not working or they have a question, they can call the admin. She's watching to make sure everything's going okay. We have masks, gloves, all of that available. Um, 
Nesca has a, a large office suite, and um, so we are only allowing eight people to be in the office at one time, and so that's one parent, one child, one clinician, and one administrator um, times two. And we have testing rooms set up at either end of a very long um, hall. Um, we've turned uh, clinician offices into private waiting rooms for parents, so they're not sitting in a wide open waiting room, they're in a sparsely furnished, so we have less stuff to clean, uh, sparsely furnished um, office, and they sit by themselves. Um, and then there's equipment and room sanitizing procedures that, that everybody has to carry out before and after every appointment. Um, so one way um, that we can do testing that I feel like conforms to CDC guidelines is through social, te uh, social distancing. And um, the way that we are doing that at NESCA is we have a large conference room that has a very large conference table. And we've measured out what six feet of distance would be between the child and the evaluator. And, um, and so the child is at one end of the table, the evaluator is about halfway down in the table. Um, everything is set up ahead of time so that you know, in a normal testing situation, I would be pulling papers out and saying, now do this, now do that. Um, in this testing situation, it gets set up ahead of time so that the first thing that they need is in a blue folder, the second thing they'll need is in a red folder, and so on. And those are all sort of stacked up in a file holder. And, um, and so then the evaluator says to the child, if the child's capable or um, if the child's younger or needs more support, the parent will be in the room with the child. Please take the blue folder and pull the paper out that's in the blue folder. Um, and now I'm going to show you some pictures and mark on your paper, you know, which is the right answer or whatever. Um, we also have uh, downloaded most of the tests um, onto an iPad that's controlled from the evaluator's computer. And the reason for doing that is it's just less materials to have to manage. Um, it's easier to clean the iPad than to clean a lot of um, testing materials. And the evaluator can control turning the page. Otherwise, if you're using a traditional easel type test, then you have to say to the child, turn the page, turn the page, turn the page. And so this way, the evaluator on the computer can just turn the page. Um, the evaluator, as I said, remains six feet from the child and the parent at all times. Everybody wears masks. Um, we found it really helpful to preview the mask wearing with the child via teletherapy so that the child is meeting you without your mask on, albeit through Zoom. Um, and then uh, one of my clinicians who did this said, you know, he, he brought his mask and had the child bring their mask. So they, after they chatted a little bit, they both put their mask on. They both commented on their masks. They both talked about how weird it was to have to wear masks. Um, but then when they came, the child was already used to, you know, had seen the evaluator with and without a mask. And, um, and that seemed to be helpful. Um, you know, it was interesting because when we uh, talk to parents about this sort of model. Many parents said that that's what they wanted to do, um, even over the safer uh, plan, which I'll show you in one second. Um, and a lot of the parents said that they didn't want their kids to wear masks and they didn't want the evaluator to wear masks, um, which also sort of surprised me. Um, but people are, you know, are really wanting the testing to be as natural and, and sort of normal as it can be. Um, I am insisting that people wear masks, um, but it's not what most parents seem to be wanting. Um, one practice is using a plexiglass shield, and I sort of have a picture here. Um, and so basically what they're doing is sitting across the table with the shield between them. Um, I don't believe that there's six feet of distance. Um, I was uncomfortable with this because I felt like you know, I think we don't know about airborne particles and all of that, and you're in the same room with the person. Um, we have kids that would knock this over in a second. Um, and my staff in general just felt like that this kind of created a barrier um, between the, uh, themselves and the kids that they were working with. Um, we ordered one anyway, because I felt like there may be situations during the social distancing testing where it might be useful to have, so we have it. Um, and, and we may find a use for it, but this would not be our primary way that we're gonna do the testing. Um, these plexiglass shields also have sort of a space at the bottom so that you can pass things through, like here, is, this is a cashier, so you can pass your card or your money through. And again, I feel like this just creates more opportunities potentially for exposure and infection, especially with kids. Um, so after brainstorming on all of this and trying to figure out 
um, what we were going to do, I came up with um, sort of this two office model wherein um, I had a plexiglass panel installed um, between two offices um, that would allow us to clearly observe the child and to communicate um, freely in the way that, that we would before. And so the communication happens with, we did a lot of research on intercom systems um, and finally came up with, with one that we like that's very high quality, um, where the child, the parent, and the clinician are all wearing headphones um, so that we can communicate very clearly that way. Um, most of the tests are on the iPad, which are controlled by the evaluator and as in the social distancing one, the test materials are organized ahead of time um, in folders. And here's what it looks like. This was right after the construction was done. Um, this is, we're in the room now that the child would be in. And here's how it looked this morning, which was really exciting, getting ready for our maiden voyage with this. Um, so the child would be sitting um, in the close position with the testing materials and you can see the headphones there, the examiners on the other side of the plexiglass. Um, again, most of the testing materials are on the iPad, but just to show you that um, <clears throat> we could set up a testing easel um, the way we would have under sort of normal circumstances, and um, you get you know quite a good view in, in both directions. Um, so the, you know, my sort of analysis of this two office model, and I'm sure that I'm going to get a lot of feedback today as it's being used by clinicians, um, is that it comes the closest of all the things that I considered to the sort of standard assessment experience where it is really important for us to be able to, um, to observe what the child is doing, for them to observe us, for us to be sharing the same testing procedures. Um, if there were a problem with the iPad, that um, we could have the child leave the iPad, go to the waiting room with the parent. One of us could go in, fix the problem with the iPad. Probably I wouldn't be able to fix it, but somebody could fix it. Um, and, you know, or we could immediately switch back over to the more, you know, sort of standard administration method. We could pull out our old testing books that we normally use. So I don't feel like we would lose anything in the testing process. Um, we're also not relying, um, I don't think we're relying, I guess maybe we're relying on Wi-Fi to do it that way, but um, but it's not doing it through Zoom, so there wouldn't be the kind of technical glitches that you get with Zoom. You don't have to worry about any of the ethical issues that we talked about with teletherapy because we're retaining control of all the testing materials. Um, as far as I can tell, this provides the maximum risk reduction for the child, the parent, and the clinician because the clinician and the child are in two entirely separate offices. Um, and so unless we find that the virus can transmit through plexiglass, um, which will be a big problem for a lot of businesses, not just us if that's true, but I don't think it is, um, you know, they're really not breathing the same air or touching the same things. Um, I think headphones may be a problem for some clients, although many kids are obviously extremely used to wearing headphones for all kinds of things. Um, one of the biggest problems is, and we saw this with our early foray into the sort of social distancing testing, is for younger children who really need a lot of physical cueing from the evaluator. You know, there's, and we test kids in here who literally are in the evaluator's lap the entire time uh, to try to get through the testing. Um, that those children will probably have a really hard time with this type of testing unless the parent is really able to sort of key in and provide the kind of cueing that's necessary and, and help. Um, and so we are saying to parents that this is the best that we can do right now, given the constraints of the situation. And, um, you know, we're going to do everything we can to make this work for your child, but there may be some children for whom this is just not going to be appropriate. And, um, and for those kids, we're just gonna have to wait. Um, and clearly, um, you know, for children who need to have a parent in the room that may be distracting for the child or may inhibit their performance, may change their performance. Um, our plan is with uh, kids who will need parents in the room to um, have a sheet that we give to parents that explains their role. And also that when we have the intake with parents via teletherapy that we would go through with them how they can be helpful, what's not helpful. We don't want them paraphrasing the questions or, you know, in any way trying to help their child with the answers that 
the testing is set up in such a way that we are going to definitely be asking their child things that their child won't know, and that's fine. And they shouldn't worry, you know, all of those types of things um, to sort of prepare them for it. Um, so that is everything. Um, I'm, I'm interested in people's sort of feedback on, on the approaches and, um, you know, questions and concerns. Um, now would be a great time if you have questions to add them to the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Um, I have a couple of questions and I'll start with that and then we, I'll give people a chance to put some questions into the Q&A, though there are a couple. Um, you mentioned using Zoom um, as a platform. Is that considered um, uh, HIPAA compliant or is Doxy a more appropriate I'm not sure of all the platforms that are out there for HIPAA compliancy, but um, I was wondering if you could speak to that for a moment. Yep. So, um, so Zoom has at least two products. Um, one product is not HIPAA compliant, and that's the Zoom that um, that stops in 40 minutes, and then you can pay for a Zoom subscription that is HIPAA compliant. Um, so our Zoom is HIPAA compliant. DoxyMe is also another HIPAA compliant platform. Um, and you know, I, I was following a lot of sort of discussion on the listservs about which is better, and there was no clear winner. Some people like DoxyMe, some people like Zoom. Uh, we're using Zoom at Nesca, but. Okay, great. Let me go to one of the questions that's been submitted as soon as I can find my arrow. There we go. So um, Nina would like to know, some others have said that that questionnaires completed by teachers or parents during this time are not likely to be reliable because of the amount of stress everyone is under. What are your thoughts regarding uh, thoughts on this regarding teletherapy? Um, so I agree with you. I think that the the validity and the reliability of questionnaires filled out now is is not going to be terrific. Um, and you know, I think. I think that a lot of this is going to come down to the interpretation of the data that we get of, you know, what, how are we going to weight the data that we get? Everybody's in the same boat. You know, I don't think there's any parents out there who are finding this to be a picnic and are not stressed out. I don't think there's any kids that are not stressed out. Um, so I think we, we gather the data the best that we can. I think one of the things that would probably be most important would be in the intake, you know, once we have the parent data, to say, if I had asked you to fill this out on February 15th, what would your answers have been? And how much of, you know, um, but, but it is really relevant if a child is regressed because of the stress of this situation, that's true, the child regressed and that's, you know, that's important information. Mm -hmm. age, so. uh, and they feel, th this individual, Nina, feels that this is uh, the best model that she's seen yet, so thank you. Oh, thank you, Nina. <laughs> Um, how are you obtaining consent from parents to take the temperature and the child's temperature? Uh, basically, we have an informed consent that we got, we adapted from the American Psychological Association, which is that you have to get informed consent to test in the office, given the risks here. Um, and part of that consent form says that they consent to having their temperature and their child's temperature taken. Um, and if they refuse to do that, then they wouldn't be able to be tested here. And I think this is going to be something that many of us are going to encounter as businesses reopen. I think businesses are going to say, I mean, there's some airlines now they're saying, you know, unless you get your temperature taken, you're not getting on the plane. So, uh, this is, this is the new normal, unfortunately. I think so. Um, is, do parents um take their own temperature and their child's temperature and then show the administrative assistant um what the results are how they, does that work yeah that's a very good point maybe we're too trusting um we have them we have the parent take their own temperature parent take the child's temperature and then write it on a form okay um, i suppose we have it at the bottom of the informed consent um i suppose that they could lie about it um I guess, you know, we're going to hope that people don't do that. I mean, you know, you're trying to walk the balance between you want to be careful and conscientious, but you don't want to make people feel like it's a police state. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So in the two office model, 
how would crisis situations on the student side requiring immediate intervention of the evaluator be handled safely? Um, that is a good question. I mean, I think that the, it would not be handled safely in the sense of the evaluator would not be the person to go barging into the office to take care of the child. Um, and the parent, you know, pr probably if a child was gonna have a crisis, this would be a child that we already would have a parent in the room with. And my thinking is gonna be that the parent lives with the child and the parent is gonna know how to help the child with the crisis. You know, clearly if there was something major, we would call an ambulance or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. but the parent will either be in the room with the child or the waiting room for the testing is right next door to the testing room. And okay. we have a cell phone numbers so we could reach the parent very quickly. Um, you know, we've toyed with whether we lock the door for the kid to be in the room. Um, and I don't think we've reached a definitive conclusion on that because we wouldn't want a child racing out of the room in the middle of the testing. But again, I think we're gonna err on the side of caution in terms of putting the parent in the room with the child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that is a, a major struggle to answer that question when you know that the pr presence of the parent does alter things right. with the child. Um, is there, because um, I had actually had a question about that, um, about who that support person should be in the room. Um, I was actually thinking of if the child has a PCA or a support person, would that be a more appropriate person than the parent? Absolutely. You know, if that person is already with the child at home. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, it has to be somebody who the parent is comfortable with the child having physical contact with. Mm -hmm. And again, these issues would all be discussed at the intake. Um, you know, and as, you know, as a matter of course, I mean, I can think of in more than 20 years of practice, you know, only a couple of times that, that a child has actually needed to be restrained. You know, I've always had somebody on my staff who's trained in restraints, but that's literally like two or three times in 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, and again, I think we're going to be really considering carefully with parents, does this make sense um, to do this? Mm -hmm. Um, and if it doesn't make sense, then what we may do is whatever sort of parent questionnaires we can get, teacher questionnaires, things like that, and just give whatever data is available, which may be not a lot, but um, you can only do what you can do. Right. So uh, another question, um, this all sounds great. However, I'm envisioning districts questioning the validity of a standardized test not being conducted in a standardized manner. How would you respond to this complaint? Um, well, I mean, the schools are gonna be in the same boat that we're gonna be in, right? I, I don't think mm -hmm. the schools are gonna be able to conduct the test in a quote standardized manner. If it's the case in September that schools reopen and that it's possible to be less than six feet away and do testing, then NESCA will do that as well. Um, Right, you know, if, if that's what the public health authorities say, okay, it's now safe, um, you know, then, then I guess we'll do that. I don't foresee that happening because I see a lot of schools are making plans for how to put desks six feet apart and so on. And um, so I think schools are gonna be faced with the same constraints that we're gonna be faced with. Mm -hmm. And um, Yeah, it seems to me that you've, you have thoroughly thought this through in every aspect of um, and, and almost setting the groundwork. Um, and actually someone asked, do you think schools will adopt some of these models for their IEP 504 testing? I hope so. Um, because after a lot of thought, this was sort of the, the best that I could come up with. And I, I think it's certainly a lot more valid than doing teletherapy. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, this is pretty cost effective. Um, you know, it was under $5,000 to get the plexiglass installed and get the intercom system up and running. Um, you know, so it's, you know, it seems to me like something that could be sort of easily adaptable. Mm -hmm. Now I have a um, question. If a parent were interested in obtaining some baseline academic data prior to September, would you recommend this? And what type of testing would you consider valid? Um, yes, I would definitely recommend this as opposed to doing it via Zoom. 
because again, it's in a much more sort of naturalistic environment. Um, and I would just do the standard uh, academic testing we would normally do, the WIAD or the Woodcock-Johnson, depending on. Okay, great. Um, someone's asking whether you accept mass health insurance. We do not. Okay. Yeah, I, I, that is a challenge for many organizations I know of. Um, another comment is very much appreciate your thoughtful planning to help parents get the testing. We know that the observation for school programs are an important piece of the testing. We currently do not know what will happen when schools open. How do you envision the observation piece in that setting? Are there any thoughts on that? Um, so normally, we, we do a lot of school observations, program observations, either of children in programs to see what they look like in school, or if um, teams are proposing programs and parents want us to look and see what we think about this as a proposed program. Um, it's not a standard part of the evaluation, but it happens with many evaluations. Um, it's, it's clearly gonna be really difficult. Um, you know, my assumption is that if school reopens in September and they're using some kind of social distancing in terms of where the desks are, um, you know, I don't know if the law will still be uh, upheld that they have to allow independent evaluators to come in and observe programs. If they do, we will come in and, and follow all the rules, whether that's wearing a mask, staying six feet away, possibly being outside the classroom, looking through a window, you know, whatever sort of seems reasonable. Um, you know, it's gonna be clear in this new environment that there's gonna be trade-offs to keep everybody healthy and, and safe um, versus still trying to get data so that we can help our kids move forward and get the help they need. Mm -hmm. you know, schools are gonna be facing these trade-offs. We're gonna be facing these trade-offs. It's definitely a new environment. I was going to ask you, um, do you feel that the mass limits the nonverbal communication between the evaluator and the student? Yes, which is why I'm not wild about, like some of my staff like the sort of social distancing thing and some of the parents seem really focused on that. Um, I, I don't like it for exactly that reason. You know, we learn so much by people's facial expressions and you know, that kind of thing. I, I, I'm a big, uh, not, not a proponent of masks, although I can clearly get why we have to wear them, but um, mm -hmm. you know, it, it really interferes with social interaction. Yeah, you can't even tell that someone's kidding by the, by the expressions on their face because you can't see them smile. Exactly. Yeah. So that's why I would much rather be in the plexiglass thing where the child's not wearing a mask, I'm not wearing a mask. It just feels much more natural. Yes. So do you have any thoughts on, or knowledge of how school psychologists could provide testings for students now? Um, so I, I was talking to Julia Landau at Mass Advocates for Children about this and describing our sort of setup. And I said, you know, if schools wanted to do this, could they set up a room like this and bring kids in this spring and this summer? And she said that you can't have kids coming into the school right now. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I was wondering if it's possible if they can't come into the schools, if, if uh, the testing centers could somehow be set up or something like that because you know I fear what's going to happen in September is there's just going to be this enormous backlog right um, of tests or you know maybe some kind of um, waiver could be given so that a school psychologist and one student could come in and and do testing in a similar type of setup you know with with a parent helping if necessary. Right, and as we, Ann and I were discussing prior to uh, the beginning of the um, broadcast, was that um, the challenge schools will face when they've already begun testing for a particular student, um, but did not complete the testing, when school returns, can they pick up and continue with the testing that they've had? Will they have to go back and start all over again because the child has now aged? Um, and the complications of that. I don't know if you want to speak a little bit to that and share what we had talked about. Yeah, I just, I, I think it's going to be complicated if testing was started on March 1st and school resumes on September 6th. That's nine or six months um, between the beginning and the end of testing. And if you were halfway through a WISC or something like that, I think it's going to be difficult to finish the WISC and say that this is valid. You know, the child could be a different, the child will be a different age, obviously. Um, 
So I, I think that's going to be a, a tough question for schools to grapple with. Um, what is your take on the plexiglass face shields, the full shields? Um, is this a safer option within the classroom if the two office model is not possible? Um, you know, I, I think that the problem is you're still breathing the same air. Um, mm. You know, and and I mean, I'm a little bit in the the bind of it's you know it's my responsibility to keep my staff safe and kids safe and you know i i have to make sure that i'm i'm doing everything that i possibly can to keep everybody as safe as possible so that's why i'm opting for this model as opposed to something like that i think also you know testing kids for a lot of kids it's already an anxiety producing situation and so we do everything we can to try to um put kids at ease make them feel comfortable and you know, maybe as this situation goes on, we'll all get used to these kinds of plastic face shields and it will just be normal. Um, but right now, I just feel like that adds one more sort of barrier, one more thing that may feel uncomfortable to, to mm -hmm. a kid evaluator. True. Uh, we have a, a question about language interpreters um, being part of the testing model for English language learners. Yep. Um, it, do you do you have that situation often and if so how do you think that that might be dealt with yeah so um we we have it occasionally at nesca i wouldn't say we have it often but we certainly have tested through interpreters or given feedback to parents through interpreters and um in you know i think that the problem is going to be um let me think through this for a second um The problem, I, I mean, I guess the way you could do is have an interpreter who is six feet away from the evaluator and the evaluator says something, the interpreter's wearing headphones, the evaluator's wearing headphones and the child is wearing headphones. And so the interpreter would then interpret each question to the child. The child would give their answer and the interpreter would give it back. So basically what would be different than a normal situation is that I would be six, sitting six feet from an interpreter instead of three feet from an interpreter and we're all communicating through headphones. Okay. Okay. Um, there's someone asking you regarding um, Zoom consultation as part of the um, IEP meeting. Now I know I've, as we had discussed before, um, uh, I have used, uh, I had clients, I'm sorry, use NESCA as their um, testing facility and um, your evaluators are are part of the IEP process um, and available for that. They're asking because this is new, will you provide Zoom consultation as part of your two office model system for IEP meetings? I'm concerned of, with the reliability and validity argument schools may hold onto and your input, the clinician's input would be essential in these meetings. Yes, so um, all through this whole pandemic, NESCA has continued to, to join parents in Zoom team meetings, um, and we will certainly continue to do so. Um, you know, I think it, it raises a really important question that, that maybe NESCA needs to raise with DESI, which is to say, you know, does DESI want to make sort of a You know, I would just challenge a school to say, well, what do you have that's better? Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, the Absolutely. school can't test kids from less than six feet. If, if, I, if I was a parent, I would never give consent for that. Right. Um, I think a lot of people are also wondering, you have multiple questions here regarding um, sharing your model um, with other agencies as well as schools so that they can implement a similar model. Um, and could you speak a little bit to that? Um, yeah, I mean, basically, um, one of my staff spent about 12 hours researching sound systems. And so I can tell you, you know, sort of, I can get a write-up of what she discovered and what we ultimately settled on um, to use. And then the construction is pretty straightforward. It's a four by eight sheet of plexiglass and a big hole got cut in the wall. and. Um, they had to move over some electrical stuff, and the uh, construction guy made a frame for the plexiglass 
pain at home, brought it in, popped it in. The, it, was, you know, it was a very straightforward construction pro project. Um, now, is that, is that currently in one office, or do you have multiple offices set up with that? Um, we just have the one right now, but we're in the process of getting a second one. Okay. Set up so that um, we will be able to have two offices going at the same time. Um, this is going to require us, NESCA is going to be open seven days a week because, you know, if you can only have two children in the office at the same time um, in order to get everybody in, I have to have people working on weekends, which luckily staff has been willing to do. That is great. You have a wonderful staff. Um, someone's uh, speaking about the anxiety uh, can cause an increase in temperature because of, because that is what it does for some. What are the guidelines around this? Um, right. And should FaceTime, um, FaceTime should sort of for the most part feel the same as Zoom, but it doesn't. Is that taken into consideration? Um, since Zoom can be considered more stressful, more focused, more intentional. Okay, so the, the first question about the temperature is, I believe the informed consent says that if you have a temperature of 100 or greater, you will leave. And I don't think anxiety can push up your temperature by one and a half degrees. I would be surprised um, at that. You know, I think if a parent said, look, you know, this is really my child's um, pattern that they get a temperature when they're anxious, then I would have them sit. There's a very large waiting area in our building have them go somewhere or go outside and see if they can get the child to calm down and then come back and try again. Um, and the, the second question, I'm not sure I completely understood. Maybe can you paraphrase it about the Zoom? Uh, let me see if I can sneak back to that question. Um, I'm just in the middle of Another scrolling question. through questions. Um, while I do that, actually, let me pose you another question while okay. I look for that. Um, there is uh, a question as far as the speech and language um, assessments that they need, to, some districts are claiming that they need to be done in person. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think that they, um, that the fact that they need to be done in person or that they can be done remotely? What are your feelings on that? Um, I'm not a speech language pathologist, so take what I say with a grain of salt. Um, I mean, I'm concerned about teletherapy as a basis for doing any kind of testing. Um, and I certainly wouldn't want to have an entire evaluation done that way. You know, to me, it seems like it would make more sense to do it using a model like this. Um, some testing I think will be difficult to do, you know, no matter what, like I have an occupational therapist on my staff here who used to be in one of the public schools. And she said, even with this sort of two office model, we can't really do any OT evals until we can be in the same room with a child. Okay. Uh, so, but speech and language, I would think would be more similar to neuropsych. Mm -hmm. um, so that previous question was FaceTime should for the most part feel the same as Zoom, but it doesn't. Is that taken into consideration? Zoom is more stressful, more focused, more intentional. Um, fa FaceTime like face-to-face -face or FaceTime the I app? believe FaceTime the app. Okay. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, I may be missing something. Somebody would like to clarify that because I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I don't, I don't completely understand. I mean, I, I guess the, the simple answer is that everything is being taken into consideration. And, you know, that's something that as good evaluators, we would do anyway, you know, so that, it, for example, if we're testing kids three days before Christmas, we take into consideration that they may be, you know, wildly excited about Christmas vacation or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, so we're used to trying to consider what all the factors are that might be influencing how a child is presenting. And that's why, you know, I started off this um, presentation with saying history observations and testing are all really important. And so, you know, to say to a parent, here's how your child presented, is this typical? Are you surprised to hear this? You know, are you surprised to hear that your child was kind of rude during the testing by saying this, this, and this? And they might say, no, you know, he's impulsive. He always says things like that. Or, wow, I'm really surprised. You know, he's normally very polite and socially skilled. That's data, you know, because then the question That's is, true. why did this normally polite, socially skilled child make inappropriate comments during the testing? Mm-hmm. 
and then we would try to get to the bottom of figuring that out. So, um, it, you know, so in a good evaluation, everything gets taken into consideration. Mm -hmm. There's actually um, several comments regarding, um, you know, appreciating the, the thought and everything that you put into that. One person does ask, um, did you have a medical infectious disease consultation regarding your new model? Um, good question. We did not. Um, what we did do is to rely on the um, guidelines from the CDC. Okay, great. Um, staff uh, who do therapy taking new clients. So, sorry, say that again. Is your staff um, that do therapy, are they taking new clients? Um, are you working just prior with, with prior clients? Yes, nope, they are taking new clients. Great. Yeah, and in fact, we had uh, one neuropsychologist who's no longer gonna be a neuropsychologist. She's gonna go back to her roots as a therapist. So she's, she's got quite a lot of openings. Actually, that's Stephanie who we were talking about before. Uh, uh. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry, uh, was a moment of disappointment there. That's right. Um, and she is fabulous. Yeah, she is, but she's, she's also a fabulous therapist. That's where she came from, the therapy world. I'm sure. Um, there's a question regarding the use of the headphones rather than speakers. Is there a preference for the headphones? Um, yeah, I wish Angela, who did all this research, was here to tell me. She, um, yeah, I think it had to do with sound quality or something like that. I mean, she certainly looked into that, um, if there could just be two speakers, and she um, discarded that option for some reason and felt that the headphones was the best option. And someone else pointed out that interpreters can be remote. Do you think that's an effective way of working or is that harder because of the nonverbal communication? Yeah, boy, that's, yeah, I hadn't even thought of that. That's true, they could obviously be remote. Um, I, you know, I, I, again, I think that we're all gonna just have to work together and do the best that we can. And it may be the case that an interpreter can't leave their home for whatever reason and if it's a question between getting a child tested or not getting a child tested, I would say let's have the remote interpreter, let's work together, let's get the child tested. Mm -hmm. um, and um, somebody else recommended the possibility of considering using the um, clear face masks mm -hmm. for hearing impaired students um, because yeah. the, the possibility of needing to, to, um, to read lips. Yep, I think that's a great idea, but I, I think we don't need any face mask if we're using this two office model with the plexiglass, and so that that's even better. You know, and then they're getting your full body language, face, everything. Correct, correct. Um, I, the remainder of the comments, and we're actually right at time, um, uh, I think this is a very well thought out plan. I think I look forward to seeing the feedback after you've held sessions, so. Um, I'd love for you to keep us up to date and let us know how things are going. Um, yeah. And and certainly um, wishing you the best. Um, I highly recommend um, referring people to uh, NESCA because it is the most thorough um, evaluations that I have worked with, um, as well as um, my experience as having the evaluator in the room. Um, or in the Zoom room at this point, um, and being able to ask the questions, uh, you know, and advocate for the child as a clinician, it's very powerful. So um, I highly recommend um, people, if they can, working with NESCA um, and with your fabulous team. Thank you. Um, so, Thank you, Anne. Um, I know that the information that you provided will make a difference in the lives of many of the students that we all work with, um, and that that is the mission of both of our agencies. Absolutely. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, oh if you're interested in continuing the goal of helping children, please consider becoming a special education surrogate parent for students in the custody of the Department of Children and Family. You can find out more information about this very important role and needed role by visiting our website, fcsn.org slash RTSC. Now, speaking of future webinars, we are continuing this collaboration with NESCA for our next two webinars. 
On Tuesday, May 26th, Kelly Cullen, Director of Transition Services at NESCA, uh, will be presenting transition services in our remote environment. Uh, I highly recommend this webinar, um, particularly since we discussed a lot of the students who are um, juniors and seniors who will be looking at transition. And on Tuesday, June 9th, Drs. Renee Marchant and Stephanie Monaghan Bloud uh, will be presenting supports for students with a history of trauma and significant anxiety. Um, I will definitely be part of that. Both of these webinars will be held from 10 to 11 and register early through the links on RTSC's website, which we will add in the chat as well. Um, thank you for joining us this morning. We look forward to hosting you again in two weeks. Have a great day, everyone, and please stay safe. Thank you again, Anne. Thank you. It's my pleasure.